Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Coffee Microcaps uh, Fund Manager interview series. I'm delighted to say we're joined this month by Sir Stephen Scott from Anna Perna Microcap. Stephen, how are you? Very well, thank you very much. Um, Stephen, you've been around the microcap space, I know, for a, a while, but Annapurna is a, kind of a quite a new fund. Do you want to give a little bit of background on, on yourself and then, I guess, the, the new fund as well, because people may be probably not familiar with the, the name? Sure. Thank you very much for your time. So Annapurna was launched in October last year. It's a microcap and nanocap fund. It's looking for tomorrow's leaders today. Uh, I co-manage it with my colleague, uh, uh, Bill Leister. Bill's a, a veteran and expert in resource space. I focus more on the industrial share space. So we're very excited to bring the fund up and running to market. Uh, it's based on uh, many years in market, uh, mainly working in microcap space, uh, both Bill and I, uh, having previously run funds at Contango and also uh, worked at Deutsche Asset Management myself in particular. So that's the uh, new product we're bringing to market. Okay, great. And um, we got, I think, two two stocks. I think some of our audience might be familiar with because uh, they've uh, presented at some of our morning meetings. So we're going to look at uh, Dragon Tail and Pay Group. Let's start off with uh, with Dragon Tail. For anybody who maybe not aware of them or, or didn't catch one of the their presentations uh, at the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting, um, you know, what do these guys do? How, how do they make their money? So Dragon Tail is an uh, Australian listed Israeli software company. They've got software that manages the logistics and quality of pizzas and fast food, uh, the fast food restaurant market. So in particular, they've got so a camera that sits above uh, that fast food preparation area to make sure the quality of the food pre prepared is sufficient and, and adequate um, prior to it being boxed and then delivered to the end consumer. They also have some software that manages the flow of deliveries. So there's some natural synergy between the two groups of software. If you know the pizza's ready, they will then out find a driver and allocate a delivery driver and help manage that uh, that last mile as it comes as the order comes in and then uh, is acquired by the driver and has moved out. We have seen the software working live in the field. We specifically went to visit a Pizza Hut and a Domino's in Melbourne to see both pieces of software working uh, subject to the various COVID rules, we were able to do that. And that's a very important part of our process is to go and visit and have a look at it. So the company uh, charges a fee to the un underlying franchisee or master franchiser um, per month to run that software to help manage their uh, quality of their food that they deliver. Okay, great. And uh, what's your kind of investment thesis, uh, I, I guess, around them? Is it is it their software, I, I guess, is the leader in this space or is it more uh, you know uh, a play on i guess where you know where they can expand into other verticals maybe outside of, outside of fast food or or, or, or or why do you particularly like this one well we like the fact that there's a big blue ocean in terms of the market so it's in australia but it's also expanding into america it's one major fast food restaurants in America, and it is sending teams of, of software implementers over there. It's got a, a large contracted base of which it hasn't fulfilled yet. So we can, uh, it's got about 3,000 restaurants at the moment. During COVID, it had to halt the uh, installation of the software into those restaurants, particularly in America. Now that COVID has relaxed, we think the pace of implementation into those overseas restaurants will pick up. So we like the fact that it is got a big blue market, we are big blue ocean, so to speak. We also like the fact that it manages food safety and cleanliness, and also a degree of COVID risk around uh, those, those fast food industries. We think that as a reopening play, whilst fast food's done well during the downturn, we think the underlying demand is still going to be strong, even as we move into a more open COVID environment. And also they can get their staff in, in, in to actually implement software into their clients. We also think it saves on uh, uh, complaints. So the software in particular would make sure that, for example, the pizza has enough prawns on it. And if you claim you didn't, you ordered a prawn pizza, but you didn't, you got a tomato pizza, they can actually prove that. And that reduces the degree of complaints and rework. Um, and also it manages the, uh, the temperature and the quality of the product that they're delivering. So when we visited these company, these uh, individual franchisees, it's a little bit of a cottage, in, cottage industry, 
It's in the need of some standardization and of some software to manage the quality. And we think that plays into reopening quality and it's got a big blue ocean. And then there's also the likes of Uber and the other big um, providers that are enabling this industry, rightly or wrongly. Uh, they are growing the industry by um, that delivery uh, mechanism. And we think that there's a degree of growth um, as, that, as the industry is enabled by those bigger players uh, enabling the delivery model. Okay, great. And I guess, as you said, they've, they've a lot of, they've a lot of um, I guess, restaurants on the books and, and a big backlog of uh, customers that need to be installed, which obviously COVID delayed a lot. Is that one of the risks for in the next 12 or 18 months that, you know, just having so many back orders, you know, like, you, you know, implementation could be very lumpy and, you know, that starts to play havoc with cash flow and stuff, because I know they're, they're not cash flow positive yet, but, you know, what are kind of some of the risks that might be, might be facing uh, Dragon Tail in this rollout? Um, some of the risks are that they can't get their teams in, in to implement a software. Some of the software they've developed are a remote implementation strategy, which has uh, allowed them to uh, um, circumnavigate some of the COVID risk. But it is true that they do need those teams to be able to get into America and implement in particular. Um, we would note that a very, very high level of vaccines, uh, vaccine rates in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's highly likely uh, that those teams have had vaccinations and they'll be back into, into those American markets to implement. They can also remotely implement. But if, if there were a new version or uh, travel was completely shut down again into America in particular, that would be a risk for the business. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then, uh, so I guess, is that the key milestone that would kind of, because uh, they're, uh, I'm guessing they're Appendix 4C reporting, is that kind of key milestone we should be looking at over the next kind of 12 months with, with Dragon Tail is, you know, how the implementation has gone and the number of restaurants, you know, is increasing kind of quarter on quarter that are actually live using their system. And you, and you can see that, that backlog close, um, coming down. Is that kind of key milestones you're looking for? The, the key milestone is quarterly implementation of the existing order book. So we're modeling that to go up to about five to 600 restaurants per quarter. And as that grows, they earn about $67 US per quarter, sorry, per month per restaurant when they've implemented. So in order to, uh, in order to get that cash flow higher, they need to implement and then invoice. And so the key milestone is not necessarily new uh, contracts won, but the implementation of the existing order book. That's easy to track in the four C's and it's very understandable. So that's the key thing. And that's the driver for the business into the short term. There may be some announcements around major contract wins or movement into adjacent industries, but that's but the implementation of the current order book is, is the key for this business, in my opinion. Yeah, so it's the catch up with the 2020 work is the key for this year. And I mean, we're Correct. already, whatever today is, the 9th of March, we're, we're already getting pretty close to the, the Q1 um, finish. So it'll be coming out in April. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Yes. Yeah, let's, let's move on to our, our second stock and uh, another stock that I guess had a boon, I would say, in, uh, in COVID uh, pay group. Um, just, give a, just give us an overview uh, of uh, pay group, uh, what they do, if the, if the name doesn't give it away, I guess. Well, the, the basically an Australian and an Asian multinational uh, payroll processor and provider of software and payroll solutions. Uh, they mainly do the bigger end of town, so multi, think multinationals in Asia and also large customers in Australia. Uh, pay is very, very important. If you don't pay everyone, the phones quickly ring. So we think they have good leverage to improved employment levels, both temporary contract and also full-time permanent staff in Australia and also in Asia. And that is, uh, that is very interesting to, in, to us. They've also acquired some businesses essentially during the pandemic to bulk up their, uh, the overall size of the business. We think they've bought those reasonably well in our opinion, and uh, they provide some operating leverage to the business. Importantly too, they are holding their costs flat and they're delivering operating leverage to the bottom line in our opinion. So they've got their cost base correctly sized and realize the need to take some of that extra revenue you know, to the bottom line. Yeah, and I know, I mean, 
if if ever you wanted a good payroll provider who is last year with you know different schemes coming in like last minute or changing from month to month with job keeper and you know different things happening in different especially if you're multinational you've got different uh I guess government supports in different markets and uh you know if you're not on top of that uh it could have been a a real nightmare for if you've got in-house payroll um I guess you know it, 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 is the thesis uh, around them continuing to expand through Asia or is it kind of building out a more you know adjacent to payroll you know payroll normally used to sit be, between kind of HR and finance but is it more building out more more kind of HR stuff for them in terms of staffing and I guess talent management and stuff like that or, or why do you like it long term? So I'm the first person in during your podcast to quote Lennon but mm. what we're looking here, I think, is for the commanding heights. So by occupying the payroll space, they occupy a key commanding height structure in a corporate corporation. And so we think that's very important. So the thesis is built on improved employment levels, um, uh, growth in multinationals, um, professionalization of payroll, and increased regulatory burden that uh, the in-house payroll departments don't want to uh, be liable for or and or engage in. So there's a series of things that we think make payroll very, very important. And we think it's, it's reasonable for them to step out and add things like pension services and maybe a little bit of treasury and a little, and for example, expense management um, as part of their product offering. Not the other way around where we'll see HR and recruitment modules trying to move into payroll. We think that's tr trickier. We prefer, as I said, this commanding height structure where they're well, well situated and then maybe can add on some services. We don't want them to go into training and into you know, really um, more people and HR style roles. We want them to, to just simply move into things like pensions. And in, for instance, in Asia, they may be able to get um, some fees and some basis points from fund managers to add those pension services into, uh, into those payrolls within reason and within regulation. So it's a few ways that we believe they can expand the business. Uh, and as I said, we think it's an important part of business um, that, they, that they occupy. Yeah, and I guess maybe if we just touch on some of the risks, uh, I know a lot of people have saying to me in the last year, you know, the, the, the second year of a crisis is usually the, the worst year of a crisis. And I know we've got like JobKeeper rolling off in Australia now next month. And, you know, I think the, the, the supports that governments globally ha have kind of put in place, you, you know, we're going to see them rolling off between, let's say, March and September for uh, kind of across most developed markets. Um, so, so is the risk there that, I guess, you know, we, we see uh, companies really making some hard decisions and recalibrating their business. They've kind of been able to be propped up for a while and we, and we kind of, we, we see a bounce in employment, but maybe it's offset by a, a bigger bounce in unemployment that maybe people and maybe governments aren't expecting. Well, they, they can pick up some of that in contractors. So work may cut permanence and they may be able to pick up contracting work. It is a risk that there was an absolute formal level of employment in Australia and in an Asian multinationals that would provide a risk. However, I think the bigger risk is either in-house solutions, which we think is unlikely but not impossible, but uh, M&A activity. So a major customer is bought by another major customer and maybe they use a large vertical software company, uh, sorry, a large horizontal software company like SAP that do the accounting and then try and sort of muscle in, in into the payroll. Uh, so that is, a, that is a risk for them. Um, the problem with that, that is it's a complex implementation and payroll is, is not, um, they're not necessarily experts at individual payrolls across jurisdictions, whereas uh, pay group would be. So SAP might be able to move into the Singapore jurisdiction, but they mightn't have Hong Kong sorted out. Um, and, and the accounting effort and the uh, financial effort to do that is quite large. So we think they, uh, the bigger risk is maybe um, some of those large software companies and also some M&A activity around their client base. They're areas to watch, in my opinion. Okay, yeah, one of their clients get taken over and they've got a different provider and you, you, you end up not being what, selected. What I would say, though, is they've got, up to, they've got over a 1,000 customers now. So they are um, very good at diversifying the customer base. Um, but, you know, if a couple of those fell away, a couple of big ones fell away. But we do, from our understanding of their customer base, it is quite diverse and across jurisdictions and geographies. So it would probably take quite a bit of M&A activity to, to start to pack them. 
Yeah, and I think I remember a slide from their results presentation. It, it's it, it's geography, size, and industry groups. They you know they're not like you know very focused in FMCG or government or um, you know hospitality or whatever. You know their industry groups is also very well. Um, split across the board you know they haven't decided okay we're going to focus on these four or five sectors they, they they're really catering to to the, to the full spectrum of the economy that's correct yes okay yes and then you mentioned it and i know because i looked at their results as well you know a few acquisitions that they they brought on board to kind of broaden out their products we had, as we discussed is that something they're looking to do more of in, in, in 2021 or, you know, what are kind of some of the milestones that, that you're looking for? Is it more of these little bought on acquisitions or is it, you know, really betting down what they, these acquisitions they picked up in 2020 and, you know, getting that operating leverage and, and synergies and stuff kind of coming through the, coming through the numbers? I think that they need to focus, I think they'll focus more on uh, what they've currently got growing the number of customers. So I think I've gone from about circa 800 to about a thousand. So we, winning new customers, um, cross-selling a little bit of this additional value-add service um, as a developer um, would be the two key areas. And then um, as, cus as their customers grow, um, when COVID starts to, to recede a little bit, making sure they get that growth. So making sure they're there for the temporary payroll and the um, permanent growth. Um, so that would be the main areas rather than um, future acquisitions. However, they, they could into the future look to bolt on more, but operating leverage from growing their customer base, taking off the bottom line, I think is the short-term goal. Uh, and I, I, I believe the, most, the key metric is simply looking at their recurring revenue and their contract base and how much revenue they're adding to their contract base and their customer numbers, um, the, uh, the number of corporate clients they have. Those are two, two key metrics investors should watch out for in this name. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for, thanks for those two names, Stephen. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you to find out more about Annapurna, uh, what's the best way to get in touch? The best way is through the K2 website, www.k2am.com.au. There is the Annapurna PDS available on, on that website. I can also, uh, if you contact me through LinkedIn, I can also refer you in to the subject of the correct processes through to our customer service team if you have interest in Annapurna. I'd also note that Annapurna has a minimum of $5,000 and is open to retail and uh, institutional investors subject to your own financial advice and needs. The fund is open and we're looking to do business. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, I think yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch, they, they know where to go. Stephen, we're going to leave yep. it there for today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the time, Mark. Excellent.